In the heart of Bollinger, Texas, stands the Old Park Hotel, a magnificent two-story landmark erected in 1886. Within its walls, the tragic stories of notable families like the Seacrists and the Keels echo, haunted by the untimely deaths of three innocent children. Bollinger, a town renowned for its bustling commerce and notorious reputation as an outlaw haven, holds the Old Park Hotel as a hotbed of otherworldly encounters. Legends intertwine Bollinger and the hotel with infamous outlaws like Sam Bass, the Newton Boys, Bonnie Parker, and Clyde Barrow, John Wesley Harden, Emmanuel Manon Clements, and the relentless Jim Killer Miller, known as the Deacon. Within the hotel's confines, a pervasive aura of death and foreboding lingers. Brian and Dylan venture into the depths of the Old Park Hotel to meet its owner, Connie, a courageous soul who acquired the property in 2016. Connie, a witness to countless paranormal phenomena, has shared her spine-chilling experiences on esteemed platforms. Connie, a member of the Runnels County Historical Commission, sits down with Dylan as they immerse themselves in the hotel's bloodied past, unlocking buried secrets within its hallowed halls. As they recount their encounters and unexplained incidents, a haunting question remains. What malevolent forces lie dormant within the ancient walls of the Old Park Hotel? So Connie, can you tell us where we're at right now? Sure, you were at the 1886 Circa Old Park Hotel. Okay, and- In Ballinger, Texas. Yeah, Ballinger, yeah. Texas. Quite an interesting drive out here. It's like nothingness, and then you come upon this little town, and then you pull into this immaculate, like, old hotel. Like, do you want to kind of dive in? I know there's a lot of history, but- Well, first of all, thank you for calling it immaculate, because it, outside, it's not what it appears to look like. When you first drive up, you see this old kind of building that has a lot of cracks and, and a lot of inconsistencies. Yeah. But when you walk in and you look around, you're like, holy junk, this has got like 10,000 square feet. Um, so we, we appreciate that. But um, it's just, the, it, is, it has been here for a long time. So it, as old it is, as it is, um, the stories are just as old. Yeah, so it's uh, 1836? 1886. 1886. And we say circa because we don't know exactly know exactly what day it was actually built. But we have records, um, and, it, and in between 1886 and 1900, we believe there were many owners. And we do have some photographs down in a museum that show that it was here uh, maybe 1887 or 1889, but we don't know for sure. What we do have is a record from 1900, the deed record. Uh, in 1905, five years after that, we had a huge flood that wiped out half the town. Yeah. It just flooded into the streets in 1905. The Colorado swelled up and it flowed this direction towards the hotel. And, you know, the water just came into all the buildings and wiped everything out. So the records were kind of lost with it, with the courthouse across the street. But in 1900, we have records showing that the owners built onto it. So like they added the concrete portions at the time in 1900. We don't know who the owners were in 1900, but we all we have is the deed showing that it was added on in 1900, so. Yeah, and so uh, what we're doing our walkthrough, like you're telling us, hey, this family, this family, they yes. had four kids, they had four kids, yeah. they moved in, they moved out. But what really drew my attention, and what I think is really, really interesting, is the history surrounding the outlaws that ran through That is my town. favorite, and that's my husband Dan's favorite, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we love that section because 
you know, you know a lot about the people that live in towns, especially you know the what they look like and and their their what they you know what they wore and what some of their uh, their professions were because they didn't have a lot going on, especially for women back then. Yeah. But you know what the outlaws did? <laughs> yeah, they just tore everything up. Uh, the five most notorious outlaws in this area are Sam Bass, Bonnie and Clyde, the Newton Boys, and then you have uh, John Wesley Harden, Man Emmanuel Manning Clemens, and Jim Miller, the killer, or otherwise known as the Deacon. And you were saying that he was definitely the most, in your words, you said he was the most horrible outlaw that you believe ever. In my opinion, after researching all of this and looking what? at him, me, you've seen Billy the Kid, and you've seen this person and that outlaw, they say they killed this many people, but this guy, Jim Miller, he was so notoriously bloody that his crimes made him even uh, more of a despicable person because he would pretend to be this uh, esteemed deacon in a church during the day or at, you know, on, on church Sundays, and then he would go out and he would murder and kill for hire yeah. or for just because he wanted to. Anybody that irritated him or crossed his way or tried to stop him, he would just go murder. And and he was really known for his double barrel shotgun. That thing did a lot of damage. And he was known to kill a lot of people with a double barrel shotgun. And uh, a lot of people know what a double barrel shotgun can do to a person. I mean, he would shoot at people and sometimes their limbs would just fall right off. Well, yeah. because, and it was so impactful. It, it was it was nasty. And he, and he didn't care. He just seemed to do it because he was good at it. I mean. They hired him because he was good at it. so. Yeah, and you said that uh, the type of person that he was, and you said you think his spirit is here. Yes. And he was such a, a bad dude that he even kicked his own barrel out from underneath him to hang himself. Yes, he did. He was the last person that the posse grabbed to hang in Ada, Oklahoma, uh, when the sheriff's people posseed up and went after him. And when he got it caught in a court, and, and they, again, were going to let him off, the citizens said, no way, this is not gonna happen again. And they ganged up against the whole court system and they just took him out and took him out to the barn. And lynch hung mob. Him. Yeah, it was a lynch mob. And, uh, but, but leading up to that point, you know, his past and all the murderous things he did, he pretended to be this astounding citizen. He wore a proper dust coat, his, everything was clean. He always wore nice clothes, even when he was killing. Mm. He wore a breastplate here to protect himself so when people tried to shoot at him, that area would be protected. Um, and he just, everybody thought he was dead so many times, but he would always figure out how to get out of it. And he was a lawyer at some point. And uh, so he he knew how to work the system. So that's why I got off on a technicality so much. Yeah. He was married to the daughter of Emmanuel Manning Clemens, uh, who was a, uh, a citizen here in Ballinger for a brief time. He had also been a kind of a bad dude and tried to change his ways, but he had murdered a couple people in the process of moving cattle uh, down this way towards Texas. And as a result, uh, someone, the posse went after him and they chased him here finally to Ballinger. And as soon as the sheriff's got wind, he was here and he had, he had run for mayor. Yeah, so, I'm like, he, telling he me was, that. It was hard for him to like pretend he wasn't here. Um, but he wanted to change, but it was it was too late. He had already done yeah boiled. the damage. Yeah. Well, he had a daughter named Sally, and Sally ended up marrying Jim Miller, the deacon. Okay. So that became his son-in-law. So when Manny Clemens was killed in the in the Alamo saloon, just right across the street, uh, in the eye, shot in the eyeball by the sheriff, uh, Formwald and Townsend, Jim Miller came after the sheriff, and chased him next door to in Adolf Shaw grocery store. And remember, I told you that uh, that uh, uh, the, the sheriff had gotten his arm blown off blown by off. the double barrel shotgun. So he had retired from working as, as law enforcement. He was working at the grocery store. But we found a newspaper clipping article that said that he had been chased to the back of the building and around the outside area into a nearby hotel. So uh, we think there's a possibility that they may have misnamed that saloon. Hmm. And it could have been here. Interesting. So there's so many connections. And the fact that we get just constant EVPs saying Jim and the deacon and the preacher man. And we have this tall, lingering figure walking around here with a kind of a... And we've seen apparitions with cowboy hats and shadows with cowboy hats. It is weird. It is just downright weird. So we think that is connected to Jim Miller because he did live here. And so did his father-in-law. And to make 
it even more interesting, Manny Clement's first cousin was John Wesley Harden, who did grow up in this town and who did live in this town. And his ancestors are still living here today. And I found out recently I'm actually a cousin to Manny Clemens. Yeah, that was wild. It's just like this yeah. deep-rooted... Uh, it keeps going, though. Yeah. There's some things I didn't even tell you. Yeah. Like I was adopted. And I didn't know who my my mother and my mother was. When I was 25 years old, I reconnected with her. And her name was Pruitt. P-R-U-I-E-T-T. -T. What are the names that I walked around and showed you constantly? Pruitt this, Pruitt yep, that? Yep, yep. I named that room Pruitt Wildflower Room for two reasons. One, it's the name of Pruitt Texkeel, who lived here, and it's also my mother's maiden name. And I didn't know my last name was maiden, name was Pruitt until I met her when I was 25. It seems, it's interesting, and you go to a lot of locations and talk to owners and people that caretake buildings, and uh, there seems to be interesting connections through historical events and family and whoever, whether it's like twice removed or whatever it may be. It's a small world. It really is. So with all this death and this blood and that surrounds this area, not only this building, um, well, that actually makes me think there's, this building was a brothel twice. Yeah, at least. You were telling me some interesting things about that closet back there with someone being tied up. Well, there's, and the, yeah, and see, with any paranormal story, none of it's really confirmed to a, to a T. There are some things that have been confirmed for sure, like the, the young black man, 15 year old that got murdered and killed because they thought he had raped a, wom a woman, shot, a white woman. Shot 40. Yeah, and then we think, and we're, we're fairly certain because we found the newspaper clipping mm. that that was from this hotel he worked at mm. and they did it across the street. But um, all of these things that we're getting is the paranormal story. Yeah. And as we get psychics coming through, as we get people coming through with ghost hunting, they're all saying the same thing about these people, these stories, just over and over connections. I and mean, then we get EAPs to confirm it a little bit more. And then we find information about the hotels. So these are, of course, hypothetical or theoretical stories that we're talking about. But we do know Bonnie Parker was jailed right across the street. Ronald County. Yes, jail. just right here across the street. So, I mean, there are things that, that kind of coincide with some of these things that have happened that make it more interesting, which is why everybody likes this place, because we're still trying to find the mysteries. Like, what if? What if this is happening? What if that's happening? Yeah, it's one of the most interesting buildings I've probably ever been inside of. Well, thank of. you. That's it's, nice of you to say. It's in extremely interesting. And when we were walking around, uh, I wanted to ask about the hauntings and the events that people experience here. Because the one thing that blew my mind is when you told me that people have seen apparitions run down hallways and scream at them. Several times. Several times. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we had the former owner that we knew we bought the place from. Mm. She passed away. Uh, and we knew she was going to pass away. She told us, you know, I have lung cancer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the day that she died, we didn't know that she had passed away. That's when that happened. It was that night. Uh, we had a group of uh, people here that loved coming. And they were investigating in the back hallway up here. And they were uh, running EVPs or whatever. And at a certain time of night, probably around 2.30, 3.30, um, all of a sudden we, he, they looked up and they saw this, like, I, I believe the term would be ghostly apparition. Yeah. Uh, shrieking and, and just go, shrieking down the hole at them. Yeah. And they see it. And there's like three of them. Yeah. They all see it. Yeah, yeah. And these people are perfectly sound, okay? Yeah. Three of them are pilots. They had planes down the street at the Ballinger uh, little airfield down here. Yeah. Perfectly sane people. Yeah. Smart people, okay? They do electronics and the data... Oh my goodness, they, they were so scared. They, they One of them ran out the building into the front and said, I need you to take me to my plane right now. I can't stay here another night, bye. Yeah. I'm not coming back, and he was back in three months. I mean, that's intense. Uh, and and, and it, it happened again to another whole group of people, Yeah. like a month later. Um, the biggest things I think that happen here are the apparitions, the fact that we can take pictures of them. Yeah. So many people have gotten so many pictures of apparitions here. Uh, women from the early 1900s, uh, cowboys, shadows of cowboys, the hats. Uh, it's very prominent and very easy to tell that it's not uh, tampered with in any way. Yeah. Now, there are some times you look and we, we see some pictures of like mirrors and things and there's just smears on them. And Paradelia. You, and, and, thing, we, yeah. and you have to, you have to be skeptical because yeah. then you, then everything would be paranormal. And that would take away credibility from the field. So you have to look at everything with a skeptic eye and say, well, is that really paranormal? And does that have a foundation 
or a background to that. And we never call anything haunted unless you can at least do two or three different pieces of equipment that all that can verify the same thing. Yeah. So what we have going on here at this hotel is a systematic, ongoing, repetitive story that keeps repeating itself over and over again in different ways. Mm. And it seems to just keep getting confirmed more and more. And the more it unravels, the more we find little newspaper clippings that go here and there. We're like, oh man, just like the thing with Judge Willingham that we just found out about. Yes. We don't know. Everybody just assumed Judge Willingham was a very nice man and they really didn't do research like we did. But a friend of ours recently found a clipping about Judge Willingham. Um, and I can't remember all the details about it, but it, it linked him to some bad financial railroad things going on. Some dirty politics. Yes, kind some of dirty politics. And then <clears throat> some of the sidekicks have come in and connected some some, uh, some railroads. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so the story's not confirmed, but the story just keep unraveling. Like the one I just told you about the the sheriff running next door. Yep. We didn't know that until three months ago. And we've been here seven years. Every month, every two months, we get a little bit more piece of the information. And that comes from, you know, captures of audible voices, right. EVPs, uh, At, yeah. uh, ITC devices, and you're saying uh, you hear footsteps, slamming doors. The newspaper articles, flat out newspaper articles, all the stuff that you see down in the hallway where the museum is with all those things, yeah. those are all newspaper clippings so we've able to piece a story together. Yeah. These people lived here during this time and they ran these businesses. That's what they were called. Why did that one business only have it here for six months? What was the story behind that? Why was Mr. Weeks the first place in person to buy this place? Oh, did you know he was a teacher? Hmm. And then we found a or an article from a book that referenced a 1960 something, 69 article from the newspaper that talked about a man they interviewed and he said that the first the first school he remembered would be what he remembered was some people were telling him that they went to the first school where the park hotel building now stands oh, so and when i showed you i showed you that it was a two building house at one point yes and they had added on to it in 1900 and now it looks totally different yes so it's been a town hall it's been a courthouse briefly brothel twice it's been a music store in the 1950s they sold pinball machines and uh pin and uh jew boxes hmm. By the way, they think they, uh, Jeanette told me that her parents dug a big hole out here in the courtyard and buried a real deep, dug a real deep hole and threw a whole bunch of pinball machines, jukeboxes and dishes and junk, just all down there. So that would be fun to go figure that out with a, with a, you know, a big shovel. Um, but we just keep getting these little stories and we know it was a restaurant. We know it's been an antique store, but a lot of things have been brought into this building from estate sales and antiques. So it's no wonder that it just keeps, the activity just keeps, just keeps adding, getting added on. Yeah, we could go forever. I mean, we talk about the Honda Dolls, we could talk about the Bonnie and Clyde room, we could talk about this room, that room, but uh, all in all, uh, I very much appreciate that historical summary. I know that we are in probably for a hell of a night tonight and we cannot wait to get going. Thank you so much for having us out. Thank you, Dylan. It's been a pleasure to We enjoy to having MP Paranormal here. It's been a pleasure to talk and with we you. And just, we're just gonna see what happens and Absolutely. see where it takes us. All right, yep. so we'll see y'all in a little bit.
what's going on with you? So we just cut out on that last scene. You got like a red mark on your belly? <laughs> what does it feel like? It hurts. Are you are you affecting him? Is this is this your doing? I asked you to scratch me, not him. They always go for you. Always. Always me. Make it go make it become more red then. Yeah. Blow me up. Are you positive it wasn't you? Dude, I'm me? positive because you know how I tell you it's got that like cat scratchy feeling, that like burning feeling? Yeah. I did ask him to scratch me. I mean, we can call it what we want, but I just think it's a little particular that my abdomen started burning. Yeah, you can really see it now. It's like a straight line. Yeah, dude. it is quite a peculiar, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. All right. On to the next one.
Morning, everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, I didn't get too bothered last night. I heard a few thumps and all that, but it's time to hit the road. What yeah. happened to you, though? Uh, like, you'll see, like, my hair was getting, like, played with, and I just did not feel welcome in that room, but all of our cameras are dead, and all our IR panels, because he zapped him, he's in, uh, overnight recording, so we're recording on the phone, but Old Park Hotel, haunted? Very, very haunted. Come and visit this place, 100%. Yeah, super haunted. <laughs> So, yeah. So. We're on to the next one, guys. Yeah. Peace out. See ya.